as a researcher, one of the things that I used to always pose it among this group is when I actually want to do research of human subjects, I have to go through IRB. So I have to go and get credentialed, and I have to say why I want to study a, you know, a school environment or a community environment to be able to receive you know, federal resources or any type of grant resources from an accredited institution. What we learned, because we actually did two roundtables, is in the technology space, there's a rush to market. So there is not this like uh, permission process to develop any kind of tool, particularly when it comes to autonomous systems. So what happens? Most of us in this room have experienced what I call the I'm sorry moment. <laughs> Instead of permissionless innovation, it's permissionless forgiveness. I'm sorry, I just took your data <laughs> and did something bad with it, right? I'm sorry, I just, you know, biased you in terms of a credit app. And so one of the areas that we thought was the best practice for companies was to get into the mode of doing pre-assessment. We often talk about auditing, but what does a bias impact statement look like? And I'll be real short, you know, does it include the right, are the right players at the table? If you're coming up with a credit AI algorithm, do you have the right stakeholders who are actually helping you to understand the environment in which that AI will be deployed? That's the first thing. Um, is there diversity in design? Many of the mistakes that we actually see in algorithmic bias, particularly when it comes to um, misidentification, has to do with a 22-year-old developer who doesn't realize that their training data set doesn't have representative people, whether it's women, men, uh, women or people of color, or people who are older. And so making sure that the right people there in companies are actually exercising what I consider to be you know, good practice in terms of that. Are they testing against secondary, tertiary data sets to control for unintended consequences? You know, again, are you placing the AI within a context? It's something when Lynn and I was on a panel, this context is really important because what you might expect actually may not be the case. And then I'll just say one last thing because I've testified a lot about this on the Hill lately. I think there's going to be something that we should move for in a self-regulatory space, which is almost like this energy efficient standard. The algorithmic economy, because it's like an ocean, it's so invisible at the bottom. I don't know how many of you have swam in the ocean. When you get real low, you kind of come up for air because you're like, I don't know what I'm seeing down here. It's invisible. It's same thing happens to the inferential economy of technology. What you assume about me based on my purchasing profile, based on my kids, my status, you don't collect my demographic information, so you don't quite know who I am, right? But you make those inferences. It doesn't, um, in many respects, allow me as a computer, as a consumer to check the box on and off when I want you to stop tracking me that way.